this is the first slide because it means what it says. This is meant to be a completely open discussion to anybody who wants to copy or use or think about any of these things. But we still have got the house lights up here. I want to begin with this slide. This is Dave Wagner's presentation of the Entomological Society of America in 2003, 16 years ago. Dave was a hardcore ivory tower in the forest entomologist doing entomological science. And I want to congratulate him for stepping one foot out of that tower and into the world that brings you to this meeting today. Because the world of worrying about disappearance of insects as a whole is a political effort, a society-wide effort. It's not within our narrow guild. And I want to emphasize that that extremely important thing that Dave did was to be willing to take a big chunk of his real science time and move out into this much waffler, much more waffly biopolitical arena. I second need to emphasize that this up here in front of you is two of us, Winnie, who's sitting down here in front, and myself. She thinks I talk. We have combined been doing this for 109 years. We basically live in the forest in Costa Rica. And what we're talking about here is what we see around us there. This is the world I grew up in in northern Minnesota. This is my car in high school, parked on a small bridge over a small creek when I was beaver trapping for a few minutes. That's the kind of insects I grew up with. That's the kind of insects that are not here today. Where we are is in Costa Rica, not in Minnesota now. So everything I say is not meant to apply to the northern United States. It may, but it's not meant to. We're going down into Costa Rica here. At the ground level, it's dry forest on the left in the dry season, and dry forest on the right in the rainy season. It's a mosaic of pastures, 400-year-old fields and pastures, cloud forest on the tops of the mountains, on the left on a sunny day, and on the right on a cloudy day, and rainforest over on the Caribbean side, where the trees are very tall, and it rains all the time. So everything I'm saying applies to that entire sweep. And ecologically, if you define the area I just showed you by ecology, there's as many species in that set of photographs as there is in the entire eastern half of the United States. Now, as an ivory tower person, this is where I started out. Find all the species of caterpillars in that. That was 1978, a talk to the ESA. Today, these are the people who are looking for all those caterpillars. These are parataxonomists, as in the word paramedic or paraillegal. It's a career for them. 90% of the people in this photograph made it maybe through sixth grade. And they spend their lives, their professional lives, doing what you all do when you go out in the woods. They bring caterpillars in, rear them in rearing barns. They hang lights in the forest and collect the things that come to the lights. Since 1978, they've collected 789,000 individual caterpillars, documented them and reared them, and worked with 110,000 moths from lights. That covers 1, 000, excuse me, 11,700 species of moths and butterflies in one place, both from caterpillar rearing and from lights, and 3,500 species of parasitoids also reared. The area here, we're talking about about the size of a big U.S. city with suburbs. It's got at least 15,000 species of, of Lepidoptera in it, which is about the same as North America. 
and we're guessing about 10,000 species of parasitoids. So that's the, the raw material that we live in and work with and see disappearing. So look at it more closely. These are three malaise traps. I think you all know what malaise traps are. There's one there in the lower left-hand corner. Eight kilometers apart, 17 kilometers apart. And we run those three malaise traps for one year, three individual traps for one year. They caught 17,500 species of insects in one year. There's only 31 individual insect species in common between those three traps. If you get some idea of the bulk of your bugs that occur in a place like this, untouched, 90% of what falls in those malaise traps have not been described. This is the way it looked in 1984. Regular night, beginning of the rainy season, dark of the moon. Same light 10 years later, 1995, on the left side, and another 12 years later on the right-hand side. Now let's take that right-hand light and turn it around facing you so it looks like this. This was our standard viewpoint of the moth world in this forest at that time. We visited these lights hundreds of nights and collected and collected and collected, and they all looked like this at the beginning of the rainy season in the dark of the moon. So this last dark of the moon in May, I went out and took a photograph of the same sheet. There it is. 12 years later. Dark of the moon, beginning of the rainy season. The two big yellow moths at the bottom are the standards who just somehow hang in there all the time. You think those are imperial moths, the Achilles imperialis from there. They're not. Their genes are they're 5% different in their genomes from what you call imperial moths, but they're very similar in their biology. The two rustcholias on the left-hand side are also standards that hang in there. If I go back to this, whoops, sorry. If we go back to this slide here, those two moth species are in this slide as well, and all the previous ones as well. So somebody hangs in, but a very large number of things go down. Now, you've all seen the German fire alarm that was looked at by a very large number of people and noticed by a very large number of people. Well, this is what our caterpillars looked like. And you see in 2005, right there in the middle where it peaked, that peaking is there an in gradual increase in the number of paratexonomists searching for caterpillars. And that's the red line against the black line. So you see those two lines going up to that peak. And then the number of paradoxonomists searching flattens out, stays 25 from 2005 to where we are right now. And look at the number of caterpillars found per year. That's the same thing that the German malaise trap show. Okay. Again, the black line is the number of caterpillars found. The red line is the percent of them that are parasitized. Now these are finding individual caterpillars, rearing them through the same way year after year after year after year. And look what the parasitization of those caterpillars is doing at the same time that the caterpillars are just plain dropping. Now some begin to think about, you know, well, what's the cause, right? Well, this area where we work has 400 years of agriculture. So it's not due to the agriculture now that field of African grass that you see there bailed up is a desert from an insect standpoint, but the forest behind that desert is just crawling with insects, okay? I emphasize, we are a mosaic of ancient pastures, ancient cultivated fields regenerating an original forest. That's what we're talking about. So you can't blame fragmentation, you can't blame agriculture per se, Okay. And we all know what happens if you take a pasture and take all the sheep out of it. The species richness goes down. You put in a few sheep, and the species richness goes up. You put in a lot of sheep, and the species richness collapses. That's what happens when you take real agriculture, industrial agriculture, 
and throw it at our world. I drove 350 kilometers in a straight line across a soybean field in Brazil, what was rainforest 20 years beforehand. That is the way agriculture eliminates insects, no doubt about that. But little fragmenting and old-time agriculture and old-time pastures don't clobber the insect community. What about pesticides? In the 70s and the 80s, I walked the forests in Nicaragua that were between pesticided fields, and they were a desert. There was nothing. I tried collecting in them a lot. Nothing. Not my acacias, not other kinds of insects. Pesticides are very good at taking insects out of a forest, okay? But no insects are put on a cattle pasture. No insects are put on a sugar cane field. All right. The bottom line will take everything out, okay? The bottom of that photograph. So where is the problem? So I came to Costa Rica in 1963. So this is a, a graph published by the New York Times, one of these things you can put your own numbers in and then it gives you a result. Down the lower left-hand corner is 1963, when I arrived. And at that time, this graph says that the, where we are, the part of Costa Rica, you can do this for any part of the world, for where we are in Costa Rica, the, the dry season was four months long, 120 days greater than 90 degrees Fahrenheit. Okay. Today, it's six months long. So the dry season has increased in length two full months since I arrived in Costa Rica. Okay. Now, it's more than the six months of the dry season. It's now the dry season ends very erratically as to when it, the rains come. And when they come, they don't come consistently like a calendar, boom, you got it for the 15th of May, no problem. They come a week before, they come a week after, they come for two days and then they go dry for two weeks. And the same way they taper off at the end of the season. Now imagine that you're an insect community and you're fine tuned to the synchrony of plants, flowers, fruits, leaves, all that kind of stuff. And all of a sudden, the big Q, the rains on, off, the heat on, off, of course, because when the rains come, the temperature changes dramatically. Right? All that is going everywhere. What do you do when you are depending on those cues as fireflies, as adult butterflies and moths, all the package, right? I want to emphasize, I'm not talking about Minnesota. The left down photograph is our house, front of our house in Philadelphia. But look at that right hand upper corner graph. Those are two temperature regimes in Costa, in Costa Rica. If you live in the upper one, you live in the same temperature all year long. If you live in the lower one, which is one, a couple, two sites in the United States, you're used to winter and summer. It goes up and down, up and down, up and down. What that says to you is a one degree change in average temperature can push you way out of your world Whereas a one degree change in Minnesota does not. The tropics are much more sensitive to a given amount of temperature change than our, our, our world up here. Okay. You can also see it in this kind of thing. That was the view of our front yard, 1985, that mountain range right in front. Big heavy cloud layer on the top, which had cloud forest in it, and all the cloud forest bugs and everything living in cloud forest. 1985. 1995, we had days like the middle slot, and by 2015, there were many days like the top one. Okay? So you can see the physical change. This physical change, of course, is due to warming of the air layer of the ground, which gradually rises, gets bigger and deeper and goes up the mountain and burns off the top of the mountain. So you get this phenomenon. This is a gorgeous day from the organism standpoint on the top of that mountain. Wonderful day. This is Death Valley. Now the tourists love this. They hate the other one. But this is Death Valley for those things who live up there. 
not only is it Death Valley from a temperature standpoint, but now when we arrived at 1,000 meters on that mountain, there were no ants. Today, there are army ants all the way to the top of 1,500 meters. So you not only have the temperature to deal with, you have a whole community of predators who's moved up the mountain with the warmth and takes you right off the top if you're a ground nesting animal, ground nesting vertebrate, or ground nesting insect. Okay? So let's look a little more closely at that, that connection. The, less, the lower left hand corner is a Polistes and Stabilis nest on our house, down in the bottom lands. They used to be so common that when you walked into bush, you looked where you were walking because these nests were everywhere and they're like hitting a bomb and suddenly you're being attacked by five or six of these guys, or gals, excuse me. But in the dry season, they go up to those clouds in the top of that mountain and park themselves in the refrigerator to pass the dry season, doing nothing. And then when the rains come, they come back down again. So there's the wasp itself on the right-hand side. This is the way they looked in the roofs of old buildings up in those clouds in the dry season. You see the tree, tree trunk on the left-hand side with a slot in it? There, this is, they were packed, and thousands of them, inside those slots, inside the tree trunks. But now look at the lower right-hand picture. What do you see? You see one of those Polices established being eaten by Eseton army ants, who are now at that elevation. And, these, and the, the wasps are paralyzed. They're just sitting there in the, in the cold. But now it's warm enough for army ants to get up there. This kind of change is probably even more important than the temperature changes. We get a whole fauna from the lowlands into a world that never had that fauna beforehand. Now we go back down to the bottom line again, and we have different species of Polistes in the lower left-hand corner, but you see that, that um, Ancestrosarcus tedigonea just above it. It's hiding there during the daytime as protection from foraging birds and monkeys. So when we lose these wasp nests, these Teddy Ghanaians lose their hidey hole. They lose their safe spot. You see the big polybia nest on the right-hand side? That's a very aggressive species of polybia. You see the two bird nests next to it? When those wasps go down, those birds don't have a safe site to put their bird nests. And you can see how this ripples through the whole system. The caterpillars, of course, sustain a huge number of vertebrates, okay? The normal food, the praying mantis on the right and the caterpillar on the left. The bees are busy pollinating things in that forest, not the crops, in the forest, okay? And the caterpillars are up there defoliating trees like the ones in the upper right-hand corner. Look at the turds on the ground next to that green caterpillar. And look at them on the ground below the green caterpillar. That steady rain of decomposed leaves used to cover the ground a centimeter deep, two centimeters deep in the dry forest where we live. Now there's nothing. I can't even use turds anymore to find caterpillars. They spend more time walking in the forest looking at the ground than up because they can see the turds on the ground, you know there's somebody up there. It doesn't work anymore. It's everywhere. That one in the center, defoliated by the caterpillar, the Elopis, Elopis, anyway, the caterpillar in the center, up on the top is a defoliated of the Sterculia leaf in the middle, and the adult moth is at the bottom. So you say, well, okay, it's a defoliator, but the adult moth at the bottom goes through the long dry season as an adult hiding in crevices in trees, and that's food for the tree creepers who are going up and down the tree trunk. Right. The bat on the, 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 the happy outlet on the right hand side used to festoon our house when the rains came. Now it really had to work to get one photograph. So the bat people go out there and they collect bat shit out of mist nets. And they barcode the bat shit. And they say, wow, it's really full of one particular barcode. Dan, what is it? So I go and look at this and it turns out to be this flying hamburger, otherwise known as happy allergies. And no defenses whatsoever. Big, stupid, like a helicopter, like a, just sitting ducks to be picked out of the air, and the bat was just full of it. 
they're gone. So what are the bats doing? Let's zero in on something that you guys know well, tachinid flies, all right? There's one, there's a winthemia that's ovipositing on one of our caterpillars in front of the house. So let's look at what we catch in malaise traps and what we rear, okay? The big blue circle is the species reared in this forest, 990 species so far, plus the 56 that overlap with the um, malaise trapped ones, which is the little yellow circle on the right-hand side. Now, you look at that and you say, well, wait a minute, does this say that, that the malaise traps are just horribly inefficient? They can't possibly get anything like the total fly fauna that's in this forest. Remember, the malaise traps are the same forest as we were the caterpillars. Right? And then you suddenly realize, because the first hypothesis is that, oh my goodness, the traps are just for shit, all right? They don't catch hardly anything. But then you suddenly realize, those, those uh, 1,046 species of tachinids reared is over a 35 year period. The malaise trap you're seeing there is just one year. So is it that the traps are very inefficient or that in the last five years when this malaise trapping was done, the whole fly fauna has crashed? So they're not there to be caught anymore, all right? Well, we won't know until we get successive years. We've got traps are out there running now, so we'll find out, okay? Same for microgastrin wasps. These are braconids in the little white cocoons on that sphingid. Same story all over again. 900, 866 species of microgastrines in one place. All right. And only 12% overlap between what gets caught in the malaise trap. Now, at this point, I'm gonna stop focusing on what's going wrong. And we have given up focusing on what's going wrong. We put our foot outside the ivory tower and says, all right, how do we do something in Costa Rica about this? Not the world, but Costa Rica. Now, if we do it well in Costa Rica, Costa Rica has a reputation of being like a virus. It spreads south-south through other tropical countries. It doesn't influence people up here hardly at all, but it influences a lot in the tropics, all right? So Costa Rica, about the, about the year 2000, was clearly moving from the gun and gold badge protection of wild areas to involving people in one way or another in that protection. That's what the school kids are down on the lower corner on a field trip inside the National Park. The guns on the right are from the old days, from the guns and gold badges. And this is our president, not, no, excuse me, our Costa Rican president, just last week. Because this young man has decided that the way to go is developing the biodiversity resources of Costa Rica. So now the question becomes, what kind of wild areas will be most functional for the country, you know, economically and all that kind of stuff, and for the wild biodiversity itself, all right? And my analogy for that is view them as a garden. They produce goods and services. And the word becomes bioalpha, which is a shortening of the word um, bioalpha petizala, which is bioliterate in Spanish. So it's biodevelopment of the country for its contribution to, of course, Costa Rica, its five million Costa Ricans, and for the world as an example. All right? So that's where our attention goes now with the government. Not me out there with a butterfly net. Not Wendy with a butterfly net. So what we find ourselves having to do is jump over a lot of our traditions and jump forward into DNA barcoding everything. Okay, so we're basically talking about DNA barcoding the entire country. Our major causes in Costa Rica, aside from global climate change, which we can't actually hammer, public apathy, public fear, public ignorance, science ignorance, and the majority of our things are tropical, and insects are not mammals. That's how, to a politician, we summarize the problem. We've got to develop this country such that it decides it wants to keep its biodiversity. It wants to, an active verb, okay? So what are the products? 
if you do that. A populist that's bioliterate means it's making use of it, like you make use of reading, public awareness of these things being useful, and a barcode library that's vouchered for the whole country, a million species. What it is, where it is, what does it do, and get it public on the web so everybody can make use of that information. So you see, these, all these things you all know about, they're all touch in one way or another. All of our stuff that we do as a regular biologist, as entomologists, but now they're focused in a different way. So look at some concrete examples of positive things that insects can do. This is an orange plantation being seeded in on our north boundary, 1992. Uh, we're the, we're the we, ACG, the conserved wildland is the, is the mountains behind it. Four years later, it's producing lots of oranges. I mean, like, you know, trailer, many, many, many trailer loads. They go into a juice plant. The essential oils are taken out of the, out of the rind of the orange. What do you do with tons and tons and tons of orange rinds? I bet that out of our 650,000 wild species of things, somebody would like to eat orange peels. So this is the first dump truck of orange peels dumped in a national park. We got them to give us 100 truckloads. This is the first truckload on the ground when he's taking a photograph of it. Spread out six months later, it looked like a parking lot smelling like Cointreau, six inches deep in mud. 18 months later, there wasn't a trace of the orange peels. Three surfids and this stratiomyid ate them all, along with the fungi and the bacteria that came with them. These are wild insects from that forest. Today, people come from Africa to us to see it, to take the information about these black flies home, to grow them as chicken feed in Africa. So we took 1,000 truckloads as part of a deal with the orange juice company. Six months later, same thing. Five years later, 123 species of woody plants growing in that site. Gorgeous soil underneath it. Our cost was $3,000. Okay. Now the second example of using insects is we are at the top. The, ACG, the um, uh, World Heritage Site at the top and government private land below it is where the National Electric Company, very, very, very powerful agency of the government, want to do their geothermal project. Why? Because underneath it is this huge resource. Where the yellow star is, is right on our boundary, as you can see. So there it is, right on our boundary. There's a malaise trap underneath each of those yellow stars. Run for a year to ask what is the reaction of the insect community as a very complicated thermometer to that drilling site, which is two hectares. Remember, this is not petroleum, not gold. This is geothermal, which doesn't use funny chemicals. There's the trap when the first bulldozer went through that forest. There it is developing. There it is drilling. So we're monitoring all this activity as it happens. There's the numbers that come out of it. 144,000 insects were caught by those traps in one year. 8,650 species of insects in one trap. And it cost us $3.14 to barcode all of them individually, every single one. Okay. That gave us a snapshot. That gave us numbers as to how that plot reacted. The red line at the top, See me. The red line that goes up and down violently is the actual margin of the plot. And all the other lines at the bottom are inside the forest. It turns out that where that yellow star is, there's a major perturbation. Of course. That's like the edge of a cornfield, the edge of a, wheat, of a pasture, edge of a road. But there the red circle is, and all the blue circles, 50 meters in, as far as the insect community is concerned, this site doesn't exist. No change, no, no, no impact. The actual distance is about 15 meters that there's an impact. So now the engineers have a particular 
numerical, descriptive thing they can understand to figure out what should be their mitigation cost for cutting this chunk out of a piece of primary, gorgeous, very complicated rainforest. The edge, you would all recognize the things on the edge, the things that you all meet when you go to the tropics and you get out of your car in a rural area somewhere. You can see that, that diabrotica beetle sitting on the Asclepius over there on the right side. That's a corn earworm, I mean, excuse me, a corn root worm, um, which came out of the secondary succession from somewhere. Uh, this butterfly lives in the crown. So what do you end up with down there at ground level on the edge is a combination of who lives out there in the agricultural countryside and the things who live on the tops of the canopy. They come down to that edge. So that's where the fauna comes from. It's a very different fauna than what's inside the forest. Now in addition, once you get this and you can begin to talk seriously to industry about the impact of their, of their geothermal site, that's a black fly, Simuleid, on my hand there on the left-hand side, and I reach out with my finger and squash him, and that's my blood running down my hand on the right-hand side. So I'm sitting there looking at that and take the photograph, blah, 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 and suddenly dawns on me, you know, we're catching these things in the malaise traps, 13 species of Simuleid, those malaise traps. So I asked the people at Guelph, can you barcode the gut contents of these flies? Oh, yes. So they do. So we now know the name of the fly, because of the barcodes, and now we then get the, whoever it was that the fly was feeding on before it went into the malaise trap. And the fly, the particular fly, is f famous for eating only people. Well, you got the name, the Mexicans have put real names on them. You got that into Google, and it says they eat only people. You look at the gut contents from these flies coming out of the malaise traps, it's about eight species of, of birds, four species of bats, two small rodents, one medium-sized rodent, peccaries. Uh, I mean, this guy's he's eating all kinds of things. It could be moving them to you, and you could be moving them back to him. All right? So all of a sudden, the medical entomologists get very interested in this. So what we're doing is looking for byproducts that come out of this. So it isn't just me getting a bug for Ian Gall to look at what species of Echnomonid it is. Rather, it's taking the whole set of information, again, 90% undescribed, and building from that to have society say, oh, I think that's a good idea. Okay? So the electric company, the arch enemy of the park system in Costa Rica, for all my life there, suddenly comes out with this slide on their presentation showing them joining with the park system to do things together. Okay? So here's my old e one of my old ecology um, slides from 30 years ago of Costa Rica. We all used to say the yellow is the agricultural landscape. The green is the national parks. Fine. Wrong. The yellow is one crop. The green is a, another crop. Okay? So what is Costa Rica's number one crop? This is a photograph full of it. You, when you go to Costa Rica, are ecotourists, and the rest of the world as well. Three million, whatever it is, some huge number. They bring three and a half billion dollars worth of foreign income to Costa Rica. You remove the national parks. How many people go to El Salvador for vacation? Okay. That green is a crop. What is this a photograph of? Two Swedish students standing in the hot sun taking a picture of a termite nest and spending $500 a day in Costa Rica. I mean this very seriously. And the Costa Ricans are not stupid. They understand this very well. So suddenly they love the parks. And the more you can, uh, this book has brought more foreign income to Costa Rica than any other book ever published, period, in the history of Costa Rica. Done by Gary Stiles, one of our academic ivory tower friends when he was at working at the University of Costa Rica. This is a crop interview not of the fifth grade farm kids, but of the snake that's in the hands of one of them, sent to me by a teacher who was very proud of the fact that his student could handle a snake without any problems. What I saw in this photograph was five cell phones taking a picture of the interview. And that meant 40 or 100 or God knows how many 
other farm kids and other adults were participating in the same interview. That is the world we live in there. It's not books, it's not publications and journals, it's in a whole other communication system. See? So this is the president signing a decree that says all the information that comes out of doing the biodiversity of Costa Rica, all the, gen the genomic stuff, the barcodes, now even for the genome, you've got to have a contract. But for the barcode itself, it's public domain. And the collateral information is public domain. And a formal decree now, not just rumor. Okay. And like I say, just last week he ended up on the cover of Time magazine as part of that. This is the name of the project. And it's to bring everybody together to work on one central thing. Keep Costa Rica's wild biodiversity alive. So how are we addressing the biodiversity crisis? We're doing everything we can to render Costa Rica's surviving biodiversity welcome. And that'll spread like a virus. Thank you. I have no idea if we have time for questions, and I think Dave will have to decide that. And we do have time for a couple questions. Since I'm basically deaf, Winnie is coming up here to hear your question, and then she can tell me or she can answer the question. I would hope I might have a little more to offer. I also yes. uh, may need help hearing the questions because I live in a very high volume world with this guy. But is there anybody, is there anyone who has a question? I'm sorry, the very last part after the tension with ecotourism, the tension between ecotourism and what? Uh, okay, as I understood the question, it was the tension between ecotourism being a very good source of funds for the country and the truth that air travel uh, exacerbates climate change. And I uh, the question is, can you address this tension? Uh, me. I, I, oops, I'm not sure which of these is on now. This one definitely is. Okay, hold on a second here. Hold on. I can, I can <coughs> excuse me, I cannot address that question uh, from an external standpoint because I know that people will not go to Costa Rica by horseback or by sailboat. Um, so that if there's a resource that can be tapped by people getting there, then the Costa Ricans are going to tap it. But I can't control it one way or the other, and they certainly can't control it. So you can't ask a country to say, no, we won't open the door to our store unless you arrive by something that doesn't use a lot of fossil fuel. There's no way. Okay, uh, first, I want to thank you and say that everything that both of you are doing is an inspiration to me. I love what you do. Um, I'm wanting to do the same kind of thing in Bolivia right now, uh, doing an inventory on butterfly species down there at some point. And I guess my question concerns, how were you able to reach the locals and get them involved in this? Um, there's, there's two avenues. One is we don't use the word locals. Um, we just think of the Costa Rican population, for whether they're farmers or whether they're middle class civil servants or whether they're at the top of the elite. Talk, we talk to all of them the same way. But what our experience has been is you have to, if you're talking to person X, Y, or Z, you have to ask what's important to that person. 
and then you couch your approach and your involvement for that person. So right now, there are Melius traps in, every, in all the big national parks in Costa Rica run by the park guards. We held a workshop in San Jose. They all came to it. They learned how to do it. We gave them a Malays trap, the alcohol, the bottles, and sent them home. We didn't go do it. We come back afterwards and check to make sure it's all going all right. But they are doing it. So that's how they're involved. The parataxonomists are all people who live right there. They're farmers, babysitters, dishwashers, those people. And we very carefully select individuals out of that by the same interview process you do to select graduate students and put them to work, learning to do all the stuff you expect from a good graduate student. Approach the same, you can talk to the university, you talk to university students, you talk to the government, you talk to civil servants, you talk to the, the minister of this, the minister of that, you talk to them, but in their currency. You, when you're talking to the minister of environment, you have to ask, what does he want? which is very different from what a farmer wants, which is very different from what a store owner wants. So it's a lot of fine tuning. That's how we get them involved. And we also pay them. So we spend our lives raising the money to provide the salaries. One pair of taxonomists costs $16,000 a year. We have 34 working for us. So you can see what kind of a nut we have to come up with every single year. So all of a sudden, you're doing a lot of stuff that isn't the science that I grew up doing. Okay. I would like to add to that, because in looking back over the years with hindsight, what has become very clear to me about Dan is, of course, he is innately a storyteller and he's innately a teacher. Even when he was high, in high school, spending a summer in Mexico on his own, he was explaining what he was doing. He was Basically, he was sharing what he saw in a very interesting way to other people. Our conservation efforts began and have been in part very firmly rooted by the currency of storytelling and sharing information. This was especially effective before the arrival of the internet, but it is always true. And a, the biological education program that he mentioned is a way of formally um, taking those aspects of knowledge combined with sport, uh, storytelling and conveying it to all the fourth, fifth, and sixth graders in all the schools on the, neighbor, in the, on the outside of uh, the conservation area, which is how I would say is a terrific place to start. I should add, on our budget. So we raise the money to do that for the public education system. Um, there's one last thing that is important to mention here. Uh, oh, yes. When we started the Paradaxonomous program, we got a lot of really heavy pushback from the University of Costa Rica. And the formal statement was, how dare you give those jobs to people who do not have university degrees? And our answer back was, any graduate student from anybody graduated from the University of Costa Rica wants to come out and live in the field full time doing insect collecting as part of the Meridaxonomous work, you're very welcome. Nobody, nobody comes. Good. That's all the that time we have for questions right now. I will um, point out that all of the speakers will be in this room after the symposium. and. Uh, they're going to be available to the press uh, initially, but um, you may be able to ask some additional questions as well.